Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for this special webcast. My name is Zach Horton, and I'm Development Director for Coral Reef Alliance. For those of you that are new to coral, here's a quick background. Our mission is saving the world's coral reefs. We were founded in 1994 by a group of scuba divers who were concerned about the future of coral reefs. And since then, we have worked closely with communities and partners to reduce direct threats to reefs, threats such as overfishing and land-based pollution. We are also expanding the scientific understanding of how corals adapt to climate change and applying this information on a global scale. We work in places like Roatan in Honduras, Cozumel in Mexico, the Big Island in Hawaii, and in Maui, where our special guest, Abby, lives. The theme for today's presentation is hope. Hope for coral reefs. Hope for working together as partners. Hope for the future. And with that, I'm thrilled to introduce Abby Rogers. Abby lives in Maui, and she just celebrated her 11th birthday, and she's in the fifth grade. Abby came to Coral this year as a volunteer to help our Maui team with our Ridge to Reef restoration program. When COVID-19 hit, our Maui team had to pivot from in-person volunteer days to having volunteers help in brand new ways. More than 100 volunteers are helping us by growing native plant seedlings at home. These seedlings will help reforest land and trap sediment from going into the ocean and on coral reefs. Abby was one of these volunteers and is truly exceptional. Get this, Abby has grown more than 900 plants. Some fun facts about Abby. She wants to be a marine biologist or an author or a journalist, but it changes every week. You know what, it changes every week for a lot of us too. She's a free diver and a snorkeler and recently became a certified scuba diver. She went diving with Larissa and Jen on our Maui team and thought it was awesome. Before she lived in Maui, she lived in China. How cool is that? And she is also a Time Magazine for Kids reporter and has done a lot of interviews. So basically, she's a big deal. Welcome, Abby. Hi. I'm also very pleased to introduce Dr. Madhavi Colton, our Executive Director at Coral Reef Alliance. She is an accomplished conservation scientist who is dedicated to helping the world's ecosystems cope with the effects of climate change. She believes in coral reefs and their ability to adapt. Madhavi started as executive director in 2020, which as we all know, has been a super easy year to start out in this role. She's been with Coral for more than eight years, serving as a program director for the last five years. She has a PhD from the University of Melbourne in Australia. She has a master's from San Francisco State University, and she has a biology degree from UC Santa Cruz. So kids, all you need is three degrees and several years of schooling to be a cutting edge scientist. Fun facts about Madhavi. She was born in the UK, grew up in Australia, and moved to California in high school, so she's very worldly. Her first ever night dive was in Lahaina on Maui. It was so quiet that they could hear humpback whales singing through the water. Pretty awesome. Before we start with our discussion, just a quick note, please enter any questions you might have for Abby and Madhavi into the Q&A box on Zoom, right down there. And we will answer them at the end of the call. And with that, I'll hand it off to you, Madhavi, to ask some questions. Great, thank you, Zach, and uh, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. And Abby, I am so thrilled to have a chance to speak with you today. Thank you so much for joining us. 
My first question for you today is what made you want to start volunteering with the Coral Reef Alliance? Growing up in China, I learned firsthand about air and water pollution and I have just I've always wanted to help the world and going and be living in Hawaii, I have learned about all the coral reefs and coral bleaching and I once I heard about Coral Reef Alliance gave me an opportunity to see um, my impact that I am making and being able to help the coral reefs and being able to see my impact is just something I've always wanted to do. Oh, that is so great. And I love hearing um, from anyone that they have a mission to make the world a better place, but it's particularly encouraging when it's in young folk like yourself. So you, I understand, are growing something over 900 plants on your patio. And they're um, native to, they're species that are all native to Hawaii. Can you tell me about your favorite plant? I think my favorite plant is the ma'o, the Hawaiian cotton because they start out in a little um, shell with fuzzies and you have to plant them far deep into the ground. And I really like how even though they take a while to um, germinate, they can grow into such big plants and their leaves are magnificent. And I love to see how they can grow and become just such big and helpful plants. Yeah, yeah, because those the big plants are really good at stopping that sediment um, before it runs into the ocean. That's great. Ma -o, I'll have to remember that. <laughs> um, so you have you've lived all over the world. You've had a chance to see lots of different things. And it seems like one of your favorite things are coral reefs. Can you tell me why you love coral reefs? I love coral reefs because of their biodiversity. I think that is amazing that um, there can be so many different species of corals and how everything's almost like a food chain. It starts out with the corals, which is the base, and then they go from the small fish to the big fish. So it's truly fascinating to see the coral reefs because they are the star of the whole ocean's ecosystem. And they are truly amazing because they're such complex um, organisms. And I think that is just so amazing that they are the foundation of coral and mm -hmm. all the biodiversity. Yeah, they form the, the habitat, the home for all of those different species. You know, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm diving, I like to pretend that I'm an explorer and I'm exploring a foreign world. And sometimes being a, on a coral reef feels like visiting another planet. Do you ever have that experience? I do because, um, fish come in all shapes and sizes and it's almost like another planet but it's on ours. I think it is truly like going to a different place because it is so amazing to see all the different types of species that of fish and corals there are. Mm -hmm. um, so you're you know you're very well educated on some of the the threats facing reefs. What of those threats has you most concerned? I think the biggest concern is coral bleaching. I think that it is a very big problem because when temperatures rise in the ocean, it is coral reefs usually um, do not make it, they turn white. And then that means that the animals cannot feed off of the coral reefs and that can make a bigger impact all the way up to the biggest animals. So I think I personally feel that the biggest problem for the coral reefs is coral bleaching. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a big one. Have you ever seen a coral that's bleached or bleaching? Yes, I see many of them when I go out for snorkels and it is devastating because they could have been such wonderful animals that provide so much food. But yes, I, I do see them a lot. Yeah, yeah, it's it's so tough to see when our when you can really see the effects of these global changes in your in your backyard. In your case, um, it can be really really challenging. So, from your perspective, um, what do you why do you think it's important to save coral reefs? I think, in my perspective, I think it is very important to save coral reefs because they can do so much for us as well as the fish around us. Coral reefs are, are home to lots of fish and that means that and humans you eat a lot of fish and 
then once coral reefs die, the people who live near the ocean, it does not become as safe. So I think coral reefs are very important for us humans as well as all the other fish and keeping it a biodiverse place. Yeah, you've touched on something really interesting there because I think a lot of people, um, particularly uh, those of us who live far away from coral reefs, don't realize how many benefits corals provide to us humans. They provide food, they provide uh, shelter from storms, um, and then uh, there are a lot of medical compounds that have been sourced from animals and organisms that live on coral reefs, including things in sunscreen. So they're so valuable that their loss is not just not just something we would they're not just something we would miss because they're beautiful and amazing. We would miss them because they also help us so much. So I hear you're a new scuba diver. Um, you've been snorkeling for a long time and free diving for a while. What made you want to learn to scuba dive? Um, scuba diving was something that my dad enjoys to do a lot and I really like being scuba diving because it feels like you are almost a part of the coral reefs and part of the underwater ecosystem um, instead of just floating above it. I think that you can also see a lot more because you can go down and you can peek into all the um, places where all the fish hide and I think scuba diving you get to go out farther and you can explore more and you just feel like a part of the reef and it's super amazing. Mm -hmm. I also like it because I'm not very good at holding my breath and if I've got a scuba tank with me I can just stop in one spot and sit there. Actually one of the the last dives I did on Maui we found an octopus. It was a day dive but there was an mm -hmm. octopus sitting out on top of a little um, coral bummy and it was sitting it was flashing its colors and changing its textures and I got to just sit there for 20 minutes watching an octopus. And if I'd been free diving, I think I would have scared it off. So I'm right with you and love loving that feeling of being immersed in the environment and, and almost almost part of it. That is so cool. I just saw an <laughs> octopus changing colors in the day. Yeah, I know. Felt really special. What has been your favorite dive so far? I think my favorite dive would be um, Polo Beach because I got t the chance to see a white tip reef shark. It was about eight feet long. And I just find it so amazing how, even though they do seem like they are very um, predatorial and scary animals, I think that it's amazing how they just, um, how they can just swiftly move around and they're quite amazing because of their size. Um, and I also got to see an octopus that day and it was super incredible because I looked at it for five seconds, I turned away and it was gone. It's super cool how they can just blend into their environment. So I think my favorite dive would be Polo Beach. How about you? Ooh, where's my favorite dive? One of my favorite dives is um, on the island of Roatan in the country of Honduras. There's an amazing reef there called Cordelia Banks, and it's got a lot of um, staghorn coral, which is one of the species of coral that's endangered. And there's this whole area on the, the top of the reef that's quite shallow. Sometimes your tank is in the air. You know, it's that, you know, just like a, you know, about a meter deep, but it's just amazing to swim across the top of it and see all of this healthy coral. That is so amazing. Yeah. Well, next time I'm in Maui, I'm going to come diving with you and we'll find an octopus together. <laughs> That'd be amazing. All right. My last question for you before you get to turn the tables and ask me questions um, is if you could be any coral reef animal, what would you be? I think I would be the Hawaiian queen arras because they are very small and they are yellow and purple, two of my favorite colors. But I also like the fact how to um, they live by helping others because they um, gain food and by pecking off all the little um, algaes and other microorganisms that they eat off of the big fish. So it's they make a living by helping others, which is super cool, in my opinion. I love that. Um, and I love finding cleaning stations when I'm driving and just, again, you know, just kind of settling down my body and being really quiet and just watching the traffic go by through the cleaning station and watching everybody get their teeth cleaned and their backs cleaned and occasionally the eyeballs, all of that stuff. What about you? What's your 
if you could be any marine animal, what would you be? Mm, that is a good question. I think today I would choose, it changes every day with me. Um, today I would choose a hammerhead shark because I want to know what the world looks like if my eyeballs were out to here. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what it looks like. <laughs> All right, Abby, now it is your turn. Grill the scientist. And can I remind everyone if you do have questions, We'll have plenty of time to answer them. Please enter them in the Q&A. Okay, Abby, go. Um, I was wondering for my first, first question, what made you want to start protecting the reefs? What made you want to dedicate your life to helping them? Mm, it's a great question, and thank you so much for starting there. You know, I'm like you in thinking that the animals that build these reefs, the corals themselves, are one of the most remarkable animals we have on our planet. They're an animal that has, you know a lot of this, that they have little tiny algae, which are like plants, inside their cells. And those algae, like plants, capture energy from sunlight and they feed the corals in that way. And then those corals build the actual reef structure. So corals themselves are an animal that has a farm inside it that can make rock. And I don't know any other animal in the world that can do that. So just from that perspective, I think they're amazing. And then they're just such a vital ecosystem. As we've talked about, they provide shoreline protection from storms, they provide food, they provide income, they provide us with medical compounds. For a lot of cultures there, um, the, you know, the myths associated with some cultures are that they are the source of all life on our planet. And so they're incredibly valuable. And they're also one of the ecosystems that is most threatened by climate change. And so it seems like a place where my love for all things in nature, my love for the oceans and my scientific background can really make a difference for this ecosystem that really needs help right now. So those are some of the reasons why I'm working to protect coral reefs. That is amazing. Um, and what is it like being a woman in a STEM field? Mm, great question. I feel very fortunate to be a woman in my generation in a STEM field. I know some of the professors I had when I was a student who were women um, before me had a tough time. I was one of many women uh, in all of my classes. Um, and I will say that, uh, you know, I have had to train myself to speak up and be more of an advocate for myself than I would naturally be. Um, and I think that's part of, you know, wanting to make a difference in the world. But I've been very fortunate in my career to have lots and lots of opportunities that have come out, um, come about because so many people realize that women, uh, we need more women in STEM uh, fields. Um, and so I'm, I, I've had no trouble really. I've been very fortunate. Um, what accomplishment are you most proud of? Um, mm -hmm. Specifically talking about what do you think you've done most for the coral reefs? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm most proud of the research that I've been leading over the past five years or so. So I've been working with um, some other academic researchers to try and figure out if corals can adapt to rising temperatures. So can the amount of heat that corals can tolerate and survive and live through, can that change through time? Can they become more tolerant of rising temperatures? And through that research, we've realized that yes, corals can adapt, which is great news. And through that research, we're learning what we can do to help corals adapt. We're learning that reducing local stresses is really important. So that means making sure that reefs have clean, clear water. So that's doing things like growing seedlings to plant on the slopes in Maui to stop sediment from rushing into our oceans. Uh, reefs need enough fish, particularly herbivorous fish. So those fish that eat the bigger algae that compete with corals for space, they need those. And if we can create healthy reefs that have enough fish and they have clean water, and we can protect a diversity of reef types, 
then evolution can help those systems adapt to climate change. So I think I'm most proud of the research that I've been leading that shows that there is actually hope for coral reefs and there are things that we can do today to make a difference. Are there any specific corals that survive better in warmer temperatures and rising temperatures than others? There are yeah, there are individual differences. So basically, if a coral uh, grows up in a warmer environment, it's better able to deal with a warm environment. And if coral grows up in a cooler environment, it's more used to being in a cool environment. So there aren't particular species that do better in some places or worse in others. So you remember earlier we were talking about the tiny little algae that live within the coral tissues. Some of those algae are better at dealing with warmer temperatures. So sometimes the kinds of algae that a coral has within its tissues help it deal with heat. So it's kind of a, a complicated answer to that question, but it turns out that corals that grow up in warmer water are better at dealing with it than corals that grow up in cooler water. And corals that have to live in a wide range of temperatures, so it gets hot at some part of the day and cooler, those are the ones that are best able to deal. Mm -hmm. And why is it important for not only the ocean, but all of planet Earth, land and water um, and the atmosphere that coral reefs remain healthy? Mm. So there's something like 500 million people in the world who depend on reefs for food and income. Really? So if, yeah. So if we lose reefs, Suddenly there's 500 million people who need a new source of food and a new way to make a living. And so when I think about the crisis facing coral reefs, it's not just a crisis in terms of biodiversity, but there's also a humanitarian crisis brewing for us as a, spe as a planet, as a species living on a planet where are those people going to go and how are we going to keep them alive and healthy and so for me there's lots of different reasons but for us as a planet it's essential that we keep these ecosystems alive for people and then you mentioned this earlier even though coral reefs occupy only a quarter of a percent of the ocean floor so there's just a tiny tiny bit of our earth that has coral reefs on it something like 25%, a quarter or half of all marine life is associated with coral reefs. So they are more biodiverse than um, uh, uh, tropical forests, than jungles, than the Amazon. So we've got to keep them there for, for both us and all of those animals that depend on it. Wow. Um, how come so much of the world's heat gets absorbed in the ocean and why can't the ocean, ocean release it back into the atmosphere? I was reading about that a little bit and I was just wondering, is there a reason why the ocean absorbs it and cannot release it? Yeah, it's a great question. And it has to do with the physical properties of water. So water is really dense compared to air and compared to land. And so it takes a lot more for water to warm up and also cool down than land. And the best way to, to think about this is um, I grew up in Australia and in the Australian summers are really, really, really hot. And we used to go to the beach and I remember running as fast as I could across the sand because the sand was so hot that it would burn my feet if I stopped but the ocean was still cool. And that's because the land can warm up faster than the ocean. And the, the ocean kind of, it takes a lot more energy for it to change its temperature overall. And so you're right that 90% of the heat that's trapped on our planet due to our greenhouse gas emissions has been captured by the ocean. But here's a fun fact. Not only is that heat warming the ocean, but it turns out that, um, as things warm, they get bigger. And so part of what is contributing to sea level rise is that the ocean is actually just getting warmer and a warmer ocean is bigger, which always just kind of blows my mind. Me too, that's incredibly hard. How does the ocean get bigger? 
Doesn't it need to add from the land? Don't we need to take away parts of the land to make the ocean bigger? Is there a certain reason why it's getting bigger? Where does it go? <laughs> it does go onto land, and that's why we're seeing a lot more flooding in coastal environments and why a lot of cities that are near um, near oceans, uh, not just cities, but towns, communities that live right next to the ocean, they're seeing more flooding. And so a lot of um, a lot of places around the world are really concerned about sea level rise that is caused by things like glaciers melting, by ice sheets melting, but then also just by the ocean getting bigger because it's warmer. Interesting. Um, and is it possible to grow corals in saltwater tanks and then in conditions that are similar to those in the ocean and then transplant them to coral reefs where the corals have bleached? Like grow them in one place, then bring them back to the ocean? Yeah, a lot of organi organizations around the world are actually doing exactly that. They're trying to figure out how they can grow corals and then plant them like you would um, grow a seedling in your backyard, for example, and then plant it in Maui on the, the slopes above a reef. A lot of organizations are thinking about how you could do that. And in some cases, it makes a lot of sense to do that because the reef has been um, degraded so much that there aren't a lot of corals there. Um, and there are also, uh, a lot of us have concerns about approaches like that because they're really expensive. They take a lot of effort for one coral. And I think personally that, uh, you know, that effort could be better spent doing things like making sure that the, what, the corals have the clean, clear water they need to thrive by reducing sediments and cleaning up wastewater. Awesome. And I know a lot of fish, there are a lot of fish, like parrotfish that eat the coral. What part of the fish do the fish consume and is there a certain reason why? Mm, so, um, yeah, parrotfish uh, do eat corals. Um, some parrotfish do eat corals. Have you ever heard them chewing on corals underwater? Once I have. Yeah, they're amazingly loud. They've got these, they've got all of these teeth that they've fused into these beaks and they take these big chunks out of the coral. And so what they're doing is they're eating the coral animal the little algae that live in the cells, and then also some of that skeleton, the rock part of the coral. And you know what they poop out? Sand. <laughs> the parrotfish take big chunks of coral and they poop out sand, which um, sometimes if you're scuba diving and you, you can actually see uh, fish pooping sand, it's very exciting. Um, uh, and so, yes, they do eat that. And it can be damaging to the reef, but there's also, um, some evidence that when the, the parrotfish take that bite out of the coral, they leave a little clean space, like a little bite mark on the reef, and it's a little clean space. And when baby corals arrive on the reef, that's a good place for them to land and start to grow in some conditions. So it's not all bad to have uh, parrotfish doing that. And a lot of parrotfish also eat algae. Um, which compete with corals for space. So we uh, we do our best to protect parrotfish. I once saw a huma huma doing that. Do they eat parts of the coral too? Uh, that is a great question. I don't know if huma huma, nuku nuku apua'a eat corals. I will ask my Hawaiian colleagues and get back to you. Great. Um, and how does losing coral reefs affect people who don't live near the ocean? Mm -hmm. we'll talk about this a little bit but is there anything else? Yeah, you know, for a lot of us, um, I don't live near a coral reef, I wish I did. Um, but for me personally, there's something magical about knowing that there are these underwater cities in existence and just their existence alone, knowing that there are all of those species there that are thriving, that existence is so valuable for me. And I know it's true for a lot of people as well. Um, and what are some ways people can help the coral reefs even if they do not live near the ocean? Mm, it's a great question. And um, there are lots of different ways that people can help coral reefs. Um, so first, people can volunteer. 
just like you've been doing, there are volunteer opportunities like on Maui, we're having uh, volunteers grow seedlings. Um, once it's safe to do this again, we'll have volunteer planting days. So taking those seedlings out and actually planting them in um, on the slopes in West Maui. And so there are opportunities like that and lots of organizations have volunteer opportunities where you can go out and help directly. And so I really encourage people to do that. Um, uh, another thing that people can do is once it comes time to travel again, if people are visiting coral reefs, I really encourage people to think about traveling sustainably. And I mean that in a few different ways. So the first is um, check out and see, does the hotel you're staying in uh, treat its wastewater? It's always a good question to ask. Is there a seafood guide you can use? So when you go to a restaurant in a new place, you're eating sustainably caught seafood. Um, you can think about using local guides and local community members and shopping in local shops to really make sure that the local community benefits from tourism because then that local community is also really interested in, in protecting the reef. Um, and so those are some of the things you can do to, to help coral reefs. Of course. And my final question for you is what advice do you have for kids who are interested in helping to protect the environment? My advice, well, my first reaction to that question is thank you so much um, to all of the, the kids out there who want to help our planet. I'm just so encouraged to see this new generation emerging that is so dedicated to keeping this beautiful planet beautiful. And so there are all sorts of things that kids can do. And I think um, you're a great example of uh, helping out by volunteering. There are opportunities that kids can get involved in. Um, kids can do things like uh, um, ask their parents to get them uh, stainless steel straws. So if you go to a restaurant or you go out, you don't have to use a plastic straw. You can bring your own straw, um, things like that. Uh, make sure that you've got grocery bags, you're reusing grocery bags, because all of that plastic ends up in the marine environment um, in a number of ways. And so, so those are some of the ideas. And then my other request is if you love oceans, please continue to study, do well in school, and then come work uh, for uh, conservation in some way, whether that's becoming a politician who advocates for protecting our oceans, or it's becoming um, a scientist who's researching and learning more about our oceans, or it's becoming a spokesperson who's making videos to make sure everybody understands uh, why to protect our oceans. So stay in school, do well in school, um, and look for those volunteer opportunities near you. Thank you. Wonderful questions, Abby. Um, very cool. I'm gonna uh, go to our Q&A. We have a lot of excellent questions on here, which is fantastic. Abby, I'm gonna send one your way first, so Madhavi can have a little water after all the great questions. I want to know, Abby, did you find scuba certification difficult or scary? How long did it take? And, and was your class different than those that adults took? Um, at first, my first discovery dive, it was, it, it was very scary for me to get into the water. I wasn't used to being under all that pressure um, from all the water. And it just felt so weird to be breathing out um, of an oxygen tank. and. My course took a little bit. It was a long course. I had to watch a lot of videos demonstrating how to take care of my gear, how to act properly around the corals, and how to stay safe underwater. Um, but I think it was very rewarding in the end, and I love to scuba dive all the time now. And you know, I'll, I'll just add there that um, that that fear, that first time you get underwater and you're like, are you sure I can breathe through things? This thing, that's not unique to kids at all. Um, I think everybody experiences that. I know the first time I went underwater with scuba, I was like, are you sure this works? <laughs> so yeah. Same way. But it's totally a fear worth getting through, right? Because the, the reward is so big. It is amazing. Awesome. We have a question from Kylie, age seven. She asks, if you could stop coral bleaching, what would you do? 
and how would you do it? Um, if I could stop cold breaching, I would probably work to um, stop burning fossil fuels because with that, it warms up our atmosphere and which makes the coral reefs hotter. So I would probably work to stop or slow global warming and help um, have the coral reefs temperatures go down. I like that. Good thing we have Abby on that. I'm, I'm feeling <laughs> confident about it now. Yeah, I would agree with that entirely. And then the other thing that is linked to coral bleaching is poor water quality. And so yes, we need to stop our emissions and get our emissions under control, but also by doing things like reducing the amount of sediment, um, making sure that wastewater is treated before it goes into the marine environment, those sorts of things really help as well. How does um, the sediment, how does the sediment affect coral ble bleaching? What makes, it, what makes it turn white? What does all the sediment and the pesticides and the dirt do in the water to make the corals turn white? It's more the nutrients in the sediment and the nutrients in the wastewater. There's some mechanism there whereby those nutrients make it so much harder for those corals to thrive. Um, and uh, it can help disrupt that relationship between the algae and the corals and can lead to bleaching. Mm -hmm. awesome. Abby, your friends, Jean-Michel Cousteau and Nan, have a question for you. Why do you want to be a marine biologist? I would want to be a marine biologist because I would love to study how everything works um, underwater because everything plays its own role and learning about that could help um, coral reef conservation because understanding how the corals work is just one factor of it. And also, I just love learning all about the different species of fish because there's so many and they're the most amazing things. They look like different aliens from a planet, but they swim underwater and they have their own way of living. And I think that's why I would want to be a marine biologist. That's cool. Madhavi, with the newer research you've uncovered, is either ocean acidification or warming ocean temperatures considered a greater threat to coral reefs threatening? Mm, it's a great question. Um, all of the research points to rising temperatures being the biggest threats to reefs right now. So corals are an animal that is a little bit unusual in that they thrive in really narrow temperature brands. Depending on the coral, you know, it's one or two degrees that they can kind of tolerate in terms of variation in their their, um, their temperature. So those rising temperatures are bumping corals out of their comfort zone. Ocean acidification, the research on that has been so interesting to follow. Corals are again, amazing animals. And they're actually able to control the pH. So whether their internal condition is acidic or basic, they're able to control their internal condition um, and maintain that at quite different to the external condition. So the um, evidence on whether ocean acidification is gonna damage corals, it seems to be unclear so far. And so right now, everyone's really mainly worried about rising temperatures for coral reefs. I have one more for you, Madhavi. What are some medical compounds that have been discovered from coral reefs? That is a fantastic question. Um, the one I'm most familiar with is um, uh, compounds in sunscreen because uh, corals live in clear water where they get a lot of sunlight and yet they're able to um, reduce the amount of damage they get from those UV rays. And so there are compounds that we have in sunscreens that have come from coral reefs. Wow. All right. Here's another question. I would like to ask Abby if she has a favorite book about coral reefs or diving. Um, I have not read any um, coral, coral reefs or diving books yet, but I am very interested in looking at one. Well, what is your favorite book that you've been reading lately? Um, my favorite book that I've been reading lately um, is Be Fearless. Um, it's about um, an entrepreneur who 
um, starts a lemonade company to um, help the conservation. Awesome. That's awesome. And Abby was telling me earlier that that person is from Austin, Texas, which is where I'm at. So I have a personal affinity for that book in particular. <laughs> Uh, Madabi, are the scientists seeing an impact in the coral reefs from decreased tourism and sea traffic due to the COVID-19 pandemic? Yes, there is some um, anecdotal evidence so far that the re reduction in tourism is being is beneficial for coral reefs. It's really devastating the communities uh, that rely on tourism that live near coral reefs. And those communities are in many cases the ones that are helping protect these reefs. So while in particular the lack of water um, from tourists, the lack of direct damage that tourists are making to reefs, um, while that's really good, um, the money that tourists bring to these communities is really vital for coral reef protection as well. So on the balance, where are we with COVID? Well, where we are with COVID is a big thumbs down, but when it comes to reef health, um, it's hard to balance out the benefits of tourism um, uh, and the negative impacts. What are some new projects Coral is hoping to work on in 2021? Uh, great question. Um, so we have a number of projects uh, just launching recently. They include um, doing the first ever uh, Mesoamerican reef wide water quality sampling program. So for the first time we'll have data on water quality from across the Mesoamerican region and that'll help us identify places to target for solutions as well as helping us identify actually the scope of the problem. And it's fun to be doing that in a time when there's less tourism so that we can also compare to see what's happening um, as tourism returns. We've got similar projects uh, underfoot in Hawaii, monitoring water quality around Hawaii Island. Um, and we're looking forward to that project really getting underway. It's been kind of stop and start over this year with, with COVID impacting our ability to um, access beaches. And then we've got some new work launching where we are partnering with the Allen Coral Atlas, which is a new tool online. Um, uh, this is a, a project of the late Paul G. Allen, uh, the co-founder of Microsoft. He's invested in mapping all of the world's coral reefs in real detail. And so we're working um, to uh, think about how we can use that information to inform uh, conservation planning that takes into account this evolutionary process that I've spoken about. So it's just a sneak preview of a few things that are coming in uh, 2021. Very exciting. And if anybody wants to know more, um, please stay in touch. And you can always visit our website www.coral.org. A couple more questions. How does algae on coral get sunlight if the corals are in deep, deep water? Yeah, so when corals are in deep, deep water, frequently the corals that are in deep, deep water don't have that same um, uh, photosynthetic um, mechanism incorporated into their cells than the corals in the in the shallower waters. That's the short answer is they, they don't really. Cool. Abby, there's a question here <clears throat> from Aunt Susie. How large are the HA cotton leaves? Um, I am not sure. All I know is that um, some of my some of my Hawaiian cotton leaves have grown bigger the bigger they get. So they are right now my biggest Hawaiian cotton plant is their leaves. I think are about um, a couple centimeters long. Mm -hmm. But I have a feeling they're going to grow even bigger um, the bigger they get. So I'm super excited to see how big they will grow. That's cool. There's a there's a couple more questions uh, for you, Abby, which is about how did you learn about the coral reefs? Did your school have a program about sustainability or is this something you just did on your own? Um, I really like to watch coral documentaries to learn a lot. And then I also do a, lots of reading on them. And I just like searching um, all how they do it online. I like to figure it out for school papers. And also I found a couple really cool documentaries describing how they work in their ecosystems and 
how they're built up and I think they're just such cool animals. That's great. You're such a self-starter. It's, it's phenomenal. Um, we have a question from eight-year-old Kira McCall in Roatan. How can I volunteer to help the corals? <laughs> Lot of you. Ah, well, um, welcome and uh, buenas tardes, Aroatan. Um, uh, you know, there are a lot of different volunteer opportunities available in Roatan. Um, and so the best way to find out what they are is if you send an email to info at coral.org, we can connect you with folks on the ground in Roatan to help uh, find some things for you to do there. And thank you so much for your willingness to get involved. I know there are, there are a variety of things happening on Roatan and we'd love to connect you with our team there to, to um, find some volunteer opportunities for you. Awesome. You got that, Kira? We're going to be talking to you pretty soon, hopefully. Abby, what is your favorite coral reef documentary, hot off the press? Oh, um, I think my favorite coral reef documentary that I've ever watched was Chasing Coral. It describes all about um, the coral reefs and how they're built and then it also talks about how you can raise awareness and how you can volunteer and how you can help and i think that is my favorite coral documentary that i've watched so far can i ask a follow-up question there about that um i have watched chasing coral many many times i have never made it through without crying is it possible to watch chasing coral without crying at some point in that movie <laughs> at the end it gets it's super happy because you can see um, that everything works out in the end and how much that they are doing to work for the coral reefs. And yes, <laughs> you can definitely a, love it. I've seen it a couple of times as well. Yeah. I think that really is a nice way to tie up our Q&A, which is, which is really the going back to the theme of hope that we talked about earlier. Abby, the hope that you bring and the hope that so many young people bring to, to this world and for coral reefs and hope for the future. Hope that we can all make a difference. Along those lines, Madhavi, uh, would you be able to share with everyone here how they might be able to make a difference as well? Absolutely. Thank you, Zach, and thank you, Abby, and thank you all for joining us today. It's been a really fun conversation um, to talk about all the things we love about coral reefs and the fact that there is hope for corals, particularly if we act quickly. And so I've already mentioned a couple of things that you can do to help coral reefs. Once travel starts again, make sure your travel is sustainable. Make sure it benefits local communities and doesn't hurt the reef. Um, you can volunteer and there are all sorts of volunteer opportunities, not just through the Coral Reef Alliance, but through other organizations as well. We've talked a lot here about climate change and the devastating effects that emissions are having. And so you can get involved in your local politics, um, uh, politics in your country, and really uh, try, try and advocate for change through that mechanism as well. And then finally, you can donate money as well to organizations like the Coral Reef Alliance. We're in the middle of our end of year appeal and we appreciate all donations, large and small. It helps us do our work of saving the world's coral reefs. And you can see more on our website at coral.org. Thanks to everybody for coming today. Thank you, Abby, you're so wonderful. Thank you, Madhavi. Everybody have a wonderful weekend and we will see you again soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Abby.